shoulders, in the shoulder, and actually when you get in the gallery, you actually see the hand of the angel across his chest really presses into the flesh. It's unbelievably delicately done. And the artist also kind of conveys the weight and the limp character of a corpse, because it's essentially the corpse of Christ in the arms of uh, this angel. And a similar aesthetic is at work in the Giambono from roughly the same time, but quite a distance away in Venice, where the anatomy of the initiated Christ is also carefully and fully described, conveying his humanity and giving him a real presence. The image is given a heightened immediacy through its tactile quality. The blood that issues from Christ's wounds in the pain is caked on so thickly that it gives the physical image an unusual character of relief, increasing the illusion of this body of Christ as both real and present. At the same time, that the tiny figure of the Franciscan monk to the left of the Christ is kind of in the shadow, but by the elbow of Christ, he's there. Um, his act of prayer before the image not only provides an example to the devout of how the image was meant to be used, but it underscores the looming figure of Christ that despite his vision, his, his vivid presence is essentially a vision, something for the devout to hold in the mind's eye. So in a way, the, the kneeling, praying Franciscan is enacting the way you or I might also use the image in a devotional context. So clearly, this is an art not based so much on classical sculpture, and this is really before Venice fully embraces classical sculpture, but rather, in the case of the Jumbo uh, but rather on the close observation of real bodies, reflecting the new attitude toward the observation of the natural world that could be found in many corners of Europe by the onset of the 1400s. And it stands that same thing from the early 16th century in the Book of Hours, uh, where this uh, Christ of Action is this beautiful, uh, beautiful, beautiful figure, unfortunately completely covered with blood and his flagellation. Thus, the spiritual goal of such images was to foster a deeper faith through identification with the human nature of Jesus, his physical suffering and sacrifice. For some of the faithful, the spiritual identification with the human Christ of the crucifixion grew so intense it came to encompass the desire for a form of spiritual union with Christ. So in a way this whole devotional movement, which was widely encouraged across Europe, it's definitely a pan-European phenomenon, um, sometimes was even too successful. Indeed, in the revelations of the Dominican nun, the uh, blessed Margaret Ebner, which was written in the 1300s, she conveys both this type of desire and the active role that material imagery and religious artifacts play in her devotional life. Her intense devotion to the Eucharist fostered visions and spiritual experiences of the humanity of Christ, resulting not only in her own ecstasies, but also in physical mortification and emotional exhaustion. And she describes all of this in detail in her diaries as quite something. The notion of Christ as a bridegroom, inspired by the Song of Songs, also contributed an element of metaphorical eroticism to her accounts. So, in this very sort of private context, the devout can, in a sense, create their own emotional, spiritual experiences, which could be quite individual. In other ways, Christian theology, referencing texts such as the Book of Revelations, also allowed for Christ's feminine qualities conceiving his body as soft and supple. For example, in the work in the middle by this great Romer painter, Conrad von Vecta, who's actually represented in the show by a tremendous painting, but not this one. Um, Christ's body there seems more of an adolescent and surprisingly sensual. But for the blessed, and actually I'll show you another French example, not in the exhibition, but uh, this is actually another Parisian example, uh, possibly by the Lombard brothers, also an artist represented in the show, where the body of Christ also is this very sort of adolescent, kind of languid, uh, but very, very sensual body. The flesh seems to actually glow. It's a, it's a damaged pain, but, but the pain layers, the parts that are preserved are fabulous, and they really give you some sense of how really sensual these images could be. So, for the blessed Margaret Ebner, the body of Christ uh, held such surpassing significance that she wrote, 
She pressed her her heart every image of the crucifixion encounter, uh, including a picture painted in a small prayer book, which she also laid under her head while she slept. On another occasion, she recalls that she placed a life-size wooden crucifix on top of her body while lying in bed. <laughs> now, in fact, we don't know this, whether this is Margaret describing an actual experience, because the practicalities of lying under a life-size crucifix are not going to happen. Um, but it does act, it, it may actually, in a sense, express a kind of vision of a union and also kind of underscoring the way in which images play a role in this kind of imaginative life. There certainly were life size crucifixes in her milieu, whether or not she lay under them or not. So clearly, it is imagery of the Andre Christ that uh, lies behind this kind of exercise. Um, underscoring the tactile and physical nature of this kind of spiritual experience. So another example for, from another part of Europe two generations later, the Franciscan theologian and preacher Bernardino da Siena deplored an instance where a male devout, in his spiritual engagement with the image of Christ on the cross, experienced feelings of physical longing that he could not contain. Bernardino writes, I don't consider this a matter to be preached openly about. <laughs> he does not indicate whether the unfortunate individual was praying before a physical crucifix, or rather, again, conjured the mind of Christ, the image of Christ in his mind, of praying before the crucifix was a pervasive and practice among the devout that it actually may well be just implied here or understood here. And as it happens, um, uh, Bernardino was often in Florence in these years. Uh, one has to inquire if the kind of intense longings for identification, with even contact with a human, palpable, physical Christ, did not also foster the desire for ever more tactile, tactile and evocative images of Christ. In short, what we would call today a greater naturalism in this depiction. And so one of the arguments of the show is it wasn't just the revival of antique art, but also this kinds of um, spiritual Christian culture in its own way, which was so dependent on images that by the very nature of the devotions that were being encouraged may have led to a kind of wish for these more immediate kind of images, if you like, more naturalistic images. So we do know, in fact, that Brunelleschi's beautifully proportioned life-size polychrome crucifix, uh, which you see on the screen, a work that likely impressed viewers even then with its sensual character, contributed actively to new ideas about the representation of Christ in Tuscany. So we don't know that St. Bernardino would have seen this, but in fact, he might have, and there was certainly, was the beginning of the creation of these actually classically inspired images, where, which do encourage a more sensual character. Um, so thus, there are two ways to look at this aspect of devotional culture. If, in fact, St. Bernardino's male devout was provoked desire by such concrete devotional images, or did their creation depend on the spiritual longings of many such pious folk? I mean, it was, I think, really probably, you know, we don't know whether it's the chicken or the egg, but I think these issues are intimately entwined. So increasingly, not only the complexity of spiritual ideas about the nature of Christ and the experience of Christ, but also the new ideas fostered by humans humanists about the, the appropriateness of the heroic character of classical physical types for Christian iconography, uh, excuse me, these are new ideas fostered by humanists about the appropriateness of a heroic character found in classical physical types that would work in Christian iconography actually began to transform. So, so following sort of Brunelleschi's classizing example from the end of the century, um, Marco Zoppo, another Venetian artist, would conceive, would reconceive essentially John Bono's figure of the Man of Sorrows in a classicizing mode as athletic, a noble, a new and triumphant image of Christ to meditate upon. So if you if you look closely, basically Christ is in precisely the same pose. It's the Christ after the crucifixion with his hands out, presenting his wounds to the and about to contemplate so they can meditate on the meaning of his human sacrifice to redeem that on sin. But the character of the images could possibly be more different. The classical model gives this tragic uh, narrative a much more uh, heroic and, if you like, upbeat 
uh, interpretation. So, so the problem of this new imagery of the unfold Christ has, uh, has become ever more essential, it's in fact very complex. It was tied up with spiritual practice, indeed a profoundly pious, but private and sometimes emotionally intense practice, that carried to certain extremes could also have a sensuous character. But it is to my mind plausible to understand that such desires for ever more immediate experience of the humanity of Christ was one of the engines that gave rise to these naturalistic images. The newly central imagery of Christian subject could end up walking a fine line between being spiritually edifying and simply physically alluring. But such imagery could exist purely in the mind's eye, envisioned by the devout itself, and increasingly took form materially, as a devotional work placed on a home altar, in a monk's or nun's cell, or some other intimate setting. These are, these are all works in the exhibition. Christian tradition provided a range of male subjects for which nudity was appropriate. The new approach, based on ancient art, especially colored imagery of Saint Sebastian, where an image intended for spiritual con contemplation came to be infused with a pagan physical type. This is especially in the second half of the 15th century. Now, devout uh, across here, the long appeal to Saint Sebastian for protection from the plague. Um, in fact, as early as the 7th century, uh, a threat that was newly urgent from the second half of the 14th century as a result of increased urbanization. And there were periodic occurrences, not only in Italy, but across Europe. And so you find this imagery everywhere. These are uh, North Italian, South German, uh, Swiss, oh, Augsburg, also South, other part of Germany, uh, Florentine. But uh, really, it was an issue everywhere. So this protective function that Sebastian played seems to have contributed to a demand for a broad range of altarpieces and devotional images depicting him in, as you can see, in all media. According to the legend, Sebastian's wound from the, wounds from the arrows associated with his martyrdom uh, did not actually result in his death, and his survival meant that he could be shown as heroically impervious to those very arrows that penetrated his flesh. By the early Renaissance, Sebastian had also come to be associated with the god Apollo, curiously enough, uh, in whose legend arrows and the play also played a role. Um, the result was the conception of Sebastian as an Apollonian beauty, because um, uh, Apollo is the most beautiful of the uh, gods, um, with artists increasingly modeling his physical appearance on examples from classical sculpture. And here you actually see, especially in, um, uh, in the center of the Antonello, with the kind of contrapposto pose, the way it's around this sort of everyday kind of face, um, that pose really ultimately is looking at classical models. And actually on the far right, Sebastian, the figure in the silver, in a religious imagery, this is a uh, uh, mother, mother, Madonna and child enthroned, um, clearly was based very, very closely on uh, classical sculpture and mimicked it closely, and I'll come back, come back and talk about that a little bit more in a little bit. Um, thus, by the middle of the 1400s, starting in Tuscany, the Andre El body began to become the point of departure for all artistic training. It was all likely of several factors, uh, increasing artistic attention to studying all aspects of nature, most often through the medium of drawing. The notion of the male body, secondly, a notion of the male body having been created in the image of God, and with that having a potential for perfectibility. And third, uh, prohibitions in Italy around female nudity that discouraged artists from drawing after the live uh, nude female model. That actually would begin to change fairly quickly in the 16th century, but in the 15th century, it seems certainly female nudes appeared in art, but they were fewer. In I'm not sure there are any drawings, drawings of the female nude um, from the 15th century. Maybe that would be no sense to that. Anyway, to this end, the subject of a nude Sebastian tied to a column, shot with arrows, also provided an opportunity for Italian artists to showcase their mastery of male anatomy. It became a yardstick of ability, the subject par excellence to show your stuff, essentially, the ultimate demonstration of artistic 
skill. It resulted in an extraordinary string of master works from a broad range of artists from which the exhibition offers a spur of modest selection. Now I want to talk a little bit about um, the work of art that's not in the show because actually it's one of the works for which there is an accounting from the time that gives an idea of how people actually responded to this. Um, so things could get a little weird. Take the case of Baccio della Porta, who was christened Fra Bartolomeo when he was ordained as a Dominican friar in 1500, already at that point having established himself as a highly regarded painter influence. And again, he owns one of its great, great works, this rest on the flight in Egypt, which is not in the exhibition, but in the gallery, but so many, hopefully some of you know this already. Um, uh, Fra Bartolomeo was inspired by the Dominican preacher, the former and rabble rouser Savonarola, who, among other things, set about to confiscate and burn images of news in news on various kinds of objects prior to his death in 1498. After taking his vows, um, Fra Bartolomeo actually stopped painting, but after about four years, he resumed at the urging of his monastic colleagues. But since the depiction of the male nude was can still, still considered the loftiest challenge an artist can assume, after another long period, Fra Bartolomeo responded to criticism that came up of his avoidance of the subject. So toward the end of his life, he actually took up the challenge and produced a life-size painting and it's now lost, but it is known in the copy you see here, uh, that he made for the Church of San Marco in Florence, which, as Vasari reports, uh, was highly praised. So I'll show you a couple of the words that are on view beside it. The painting shows a highly original variation and the standard iconography of the new Sebastian Pardo column and Shaw of Pharaohs. The figure is indeed nude, and his flesh is penetrated with a single arrow. Um, and actually, it's rather than a shadow, you have to kind of look closely for it. Uh, but rather than actually bound to a column, he's shown emerging from an architectural niche and moreover stepping down into our space as if to hide the reality of his presence. So it's actually a fairly radical departure from, from the uh, iconography. There's no even evidence of a column to which he was attached. In addition, instead of wearing the kind of modest shorts or loincloth that is seen in the most comparable public representations of the saints, his lines are covered by a transparent veil that exposes his private area to the viewer. Uh, curious, you might say. It's quite a bit racier or more revealing than even your typically handsome Babylonian Se Sebastian, such as those you see. And generally, it actually reveals a part of the anatomy that was widely considered inappropriate in a public venue, uh, even in Italy at this time. And in fact, I'll, I want to show you talk a little bit about the difference between private and public, because you may have noticed that the Sebastian in this little plaque in the show, also one of the great masterpieces in the show, um, the figure actually is fully nude. But this object, which is only about six inches tall, it's tiny, incredibly beautiful and precious, um, uh, was created probably for the humanist, the prelate uh, Carlo Romani, who was a humanist, who was a collector of antiquities, uh, who was extremely learned, and it's not a work for a public display or a public context. It was probably work as in his study with his other artistic objects, again, the kind of objects that a group of humanists or intellectuals would sit around and talk about and maybe even pass among them. So in a sense, it's a kind of more private uh, work. And so the total nudity, and, 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 and hidden, I'm sure the justification for the total nudity of Romani was because, of, of this figure was because of the enormous interest in classical art where classical subjects were completely nude, were shown completely nude, and in fact there was even an argument current that the um, uh, that, that the perfect the perfect body and the perfectly nude body could represent a kind of virtue. Um, um, so, uh, so in, in a sense, there was even a kind of humorous rationale for these kinds of works, and but very very different from the work being shown in the public. Anyway, Vasari then reports about this painting 
that Traubach Calvo may have painted the Saint Sebastian fully on the frames, the coloring of the figures like that of the living flesh, the countenance more beautiful and in perfect harmony with the beauty of the form. When this painting was put up in the church, the monks discovered from what they had heard in confessionals that the grace and the beauty of the vivid imitation of life had given occasion to the sin of light and evil thoughts. <laughs> They consequently removed it from the church and placed it in the chat room. <laughs> <laughs> so as if only the clerics would be able to um, take spiritual sustenance from it. <laughs> so before too long, Vasari tells us that it was actually the painting was actually sold out of the chat room through an agent to the king of France. Now, scholars have uh, rightly been skeptical about many of the Sari's accounts because they were handed down over more than a generation. Uh, but there are, in fact, strong grounds for believing that what he's written here is substantially correct. We know, for one, that even though the painting is lost today, that it was sold to the French Royal Collection. It's documented there and mentioned a number of times. Moreover, the conception of the same melody, as I pointed out, heightens the figure's central character, but actually does seem to impulse the viewer in its particular way. So compare, for example, the work in the show, Don Darsai's painting of Venus, um, which was made only a few years later. As I mentioned, he was a Stavlanish painter, went to Rome, he studied uh, ancient art, he moved in humanist circles, and he primarily worked for humanist patrons. So this, he knew what he was doing, and he probably knew, uh, was well acquainted with certain um, current Classicizing right? classical theory, if you like, about art. So in this painting, Venus is treated as if she is a sculpture, not set into a niche, but on a pedestal. And she, too, fully nude, appears ready to step down from her pedestal into the newer space. In both instances, the painters are playing with the classical notion of paragonia, then widely occurring in human circles. That, that in this debates the relative superiority of the arts of painting or sculpture in creating the fullest illusion of reality. Both, both artists clearly are deploying their best tricks to convince the viewer that painting is a superior medium, more fully illusionistic, more alluring, and more sensual. Indeed, Venus is stepping down from her pedestal toward the viewer, but also been understood as a component of her seduction of the viewer. And the notion of an image of Venus with the ability to arouse desire in the viewer reflects a widely held classical trope, alluding to a widely admired story of the power of the ancient painter of Pelles to arouse desire through his own very famous paintings of Venus. And these paintings were lost, no one in the Renaissance actually after saw them, but they were preserved in historical accounts that people read and admired. Um, so clearly that in this virtuoso artistic performance, uh, evidenced by the complexity of St. Sebastian's pose, the novelty of his drawing directly toward the viewer and his exceptionally lifelike character, Fra Bartolome was clearly dis demonstrated the superiority of his gifts as a painter while also proclaiming the superiority of his art to that of sculpture. He was, of course, also addressing his critics in demonstrating his complete mastery uh, of the new figure. Was he, however, unaware, especially in light of the figure's near, nearly total nudity, which is actually fairly anomalous, anomalous for a public work like this, of the danger of such an, uh, such an image awakening desire in some viewers, as Mark Vasari claims? Its overwhelming sensual and seductive character seems very much at odds with the modest and pious man described to us by Vasari and others. We cannot know the answer, of course, to what was going on in Fra Bartolome Mayo's brains, but what seems less surprising is that a singular artistic vision would have caused some parishioners discomfort and inappropriate thoughts. <coughs> so finally, to follow this work down the road to perdition, its subsequent history a bit, is a bit obscure, but it's tantalizing. Described by a an observer in the next generation as a heavenly picture. It was clearly so much prized when the, king, when the French king had it. It, it. it basically had a strong reputation. So while we do not know 
where Francis I kept the painting, one scholar has proposed that it was part of a suite of paintings of nudes he had assembled and displayed in the apartment of the Baz at Fontainebleau. Francis was a great collector of Italian paintings, having acquired his first Mantegna at the age of 10, and he also avidly acquired nudes from Italy. His fondness was for female nudes, above all, but he had several St. Sebastians, including one by Perugino. Uh, and, he also, uh, and he also had a taste for the erotic. The taste is amply in evidence in the, in the famous gallery of Francis I, that maybe some of you have seen at Fontainebleau, which Rosso Fiorentino, another Italian artist, executed for him during the 1530s. By displaying many of his individual paintings in an apartment uh, with bathing chambers, the king was consciously evoking an ancient tradition uh, that uh, did something very similar deliberately commingling intellectual and sensual pleasures. This choice might also explain uh, why St. Sebastian disappeared from the records by the 17th century and remains on trace today, which is to say that steam from the caught up in these rooms probably helped to destroy a number of the pictures and that could have been the fate of this one. So while this is only a hypothesis, there is no evidence that the work was ever returned to a traditional spiritual setting either. So the likelihood remains that its appeal was due to the artist's virtuosity, but not also for its strikingly sensual character. Thus the challenge to artistic mastery that the pious artists so nobly rose to in creating St. Sebastian was not without its pitfalls. Moreover, similar examples are documented famously by Leonardo, in this description of a patron's passionate response to one of his works. Oh, oh sorry, there you go. Um, Once I happened to make a painting that represented a sacred, sacred figure that was bought by someone who fell in love with him. He wanted to remove the attributes of the saint so he'd be able to kiss it without misgivings. But in the end, his conscience rose above his size and his lust, and he was forced to remove it from his house. <laughs> So there's another classical variation on this theme, um, which is embodied the narrative of the sculpture of Pygmalion, which actually is represented in the show in two, in two examples, which I show you here. And Pygmalion is actually a story that had life throughout the Middle Ages and continued to live on in the Renaissance throughout the very well-known story. The classical author Abbott tells us that Pygmalion despised women and there, therefore set about fashioning a work out of ivory, a sculpture that would be more beautiful than any woman to show his own spirit over it, I guess. Fool that he was, he fell madly in love uh, with his own creation, and at some point started to dress her eloquently. He then prays to the gods to grant him a wife as lovely as his creation. And eventually, on Venus feast day, which is what is shown on the Bronzino on the right, when he makes a sacrifice to the goddess, she brings the statue to life, and they wait. So on the one hand, one could object, as some scholars have, um, that these accounts of inappropriate uh, reactions to works of art merely evoke classical tropes as a means to extol an artist's achievement. On the other hand, the truly sensual character of our, character of our examples strongly suggests that these accounts have substance and that the verisimilitude of the works, along with their sensuality, can subvert a work's spiritual function. So many of you will have uh, noticed from this talk, and as you visit the exhibition, that our definition of the new is broad. Traditionally, the new has been associated uh, with Italy during the Renaissance, and with an art inspired by the news of antiquity. But it was apparent to us that, especially during the 15th century, locations outside of Italy uh, were exploring the new as well. Some of those works were based on ancient art but many, especially in the early 15th century, were not. They seem rather to be based on close observation of real bodies in an attempt to represent them as truthful, truthfully as an artist could at the time. As a result, this exhibition has cast its net widely, showing the nude as envisioned by the widest variety of artists with as great a variety of nudes and ideals of human body as possible. 
We include, we include works wherever the body itself, unclothed or partially unclothed, is, is in some way a subject. In short, the new was created not only within a humanist culture, but also within a much larger Christian culture. Within Judeo-Christian culture, as we know from the story of the fall of man, for example, um, there's always been, and there's a wonderful work by Cronach of the fall of man in the show, um, there's always been a great deal of ambivalence about the body. But it was perhaps inevitable then that artists painting nudes based both on classical models and close observation of real bodies would uh, walk a fine line between what was judged appropriate and what not. I also tried to show that art designed from the, for private use of lay individuals occasionally crossed that line as well. Possibly, in some cases, the result of an understanding between artist and patron. Fortunately, many of these same works have passed the test of time and remain appreciated today largely for their artistic merit. My colleagues at Pagetti and I are very proud to have played a role in presenting some of these works to you in the current Pagetti exhibition. 